Our liberties we prize and our rights we will maintain. This is Iowa Civil Rights History Podcast, where we tell stories about the contribution Iowans and the state of Iowa has made to advance the civil rights movement. Past stories are being told, present actions will be highlighted, and preparation for the future will be discussed. Here is your host, Eric Nyange. Welcome to the Iowa Civil Rights History Podcast. My guest today is Dana James. She's the founder and publisher of the Black Iowa News. Black Iowa News is an independent news platform designed to highlight black perspectives, showcase the black community, and amplify the voices of black Iowans. Dana James, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Yeah. I'm happy to be here. So, because we, we start talking about all other things, and I think let's keep going now. Okay. We, we talk a little bit about rock music and all that stuff, the destruction. Do you think all this destruction, because 90, 90% of the time, if you want to see the positive, the good news, the inspirational news about black people, you need to real dig deep to find it. Algorithm is not going to just bring it to you. It's not. Do you think that intentionally is being done? Absolutely. To distract us? Absolutely. It's a distraction and it's something that, you know, I've watched happen all my life. Um, I've always watched these commercials. I can remember growing up and it it was like a Barbie, a commercial for Barbies. Mm -hmm. And there'd be all the white Barbies in the front, but that black Barbie would be a little bit back to the side. Mm -hmm. And that is how media, legacy media, mainstream media looks at us at all times. We're not the main story. We're we're just off to the side. Mm -hmm. And occasionally um, they trot us out, you know, Black History Month, certain times of the year um, we get a little more intentional focus. But for the most part, we're we're just there. We're 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 to the left, and I just didn't like that. I've been part of a the media system here in Des Moines and watched how uh, reporters had to be told, "Hey, when you go out to a story, you know, make a point to talk to people of color. Make a point to get someone of color in your photo." Mm. And, they need and, to be reminded. Yeah, need to be yeah. reminded, and and they tracked it. Because it wasn't happening organically. People, mm. Those reporters would just go out, find people that look like them. So how are our stories going to be told that way? How will they be nuanced with people who really don't want to tell our stories yep. um, and have to be told to do it? And yeah. so, yeah, that's, that's definitely relevant. How important family it is to black community? It's everything. And where did we go wrong somewhere along the way? You know, <laughs> this is so funny because my sister and I, we talk about this kind of stuff all the time. And I really feel like, you know, in the, the 90s and 2000s, something went awry there yeah. where people didn't prize being in a relationship. And, and you had the rise of the situationships and mm. things like that. Things that detract from the necessity and the beauty of being a couple and then having children. It really became, you know, a negative. It, it became a free for all where yeah. whatever type of situation you're in, we as black people, as a community, we just accepted it. We accepted, okay, well, this person has, he has five kids by five different women. women yeah. We accepted that. We still got to love the kids. I, I, I've over my life heard a lot of women and grandma say that. Well, you know what? Forget the parents. We can't worry about them. We got to take care of these children. And I get that. But again, it was to the detriment of the black family oh, that we're yeah. not really uplifting the beauty of marriage. Mm-hmm. Like I just celebrated my four year anniversary. I was the type of person I didn't really grow up viewing myself in this white dress and, yeah. and having a wedding. That just wasn't something I w- was doing. And, but when I found the right person and, but I was very much grew up at a time when my parents, you know, they wanted you to be married before you had children. Like mm-hmm. it, it was communicated to us. Yeah. And so I didn't, mm. I didn't until I found that right man, you know, I wasn't um, going to do that. But there's beauty in being in a relationship and being married. There's two incomes. There's yeah. two. My mother always said two heads were better than one oh, yeah. with my sister and I. Oh, yeah. And it's so true. You have support. So when one person's up, 
and the other person's down, mm-hmm. you, you help each other. Oh, yeah. And I think today's youth are really missing missing out on understanding that that should be the goal. The goal yeah. should be to be in a healthy, good relationship, to raise children in a family yeah. and so that they have the support and love of black parents. Mm-hmm. My particular wedding vows, it clearly said constant faith and abiding love. But I've spent time thinking about what that means. Like, what does it mean to have constant faith? And have yeah. I ever had that in something else? And what does it mean to have abiding love, love that endures but still remains, with, yeah. like unshakable love? And to me, like a marriage, that's what it's supposed to be about. And yeah. so through the ups and downs, the good or bad, you're still supposed to be standing there, still supposed to be uplifting your spouse. And you do have to protect Anything worth having, you have to protect it. And your marriage yeah, is, is one of the things you really have to protect and really do have to keep people out of it and um, not allow that negativity to creep in. And I've always, too, made it a point to never speak ill of my husband with anyone. Mm. And I don't. I amen, don't. Amen to that. So there's no friends. There's no one around me that can say, well, she said that he does this. I don't do that because, number one, I tell him this. I love... Ninety nine point nine nine of what <laughs> oh, you do, yeah. but it's that point zero zero one that gets on my nerves sometimes. Yep. But I never tell about anybody outside the household. If I talk about him, it's in an uplifting. This is like a very hardworking man and very loving man and grandfather, and you know we need to uplift that. Yes. Like, and these kids, how are they? going to build any generational wealth, any longevity in anything. Mm-hmm. If there's not two people in that house home taking care of the kids, figuring it out, it, it's, it was hard as a single person. You know, if you're struggling financially, one of the first things that kind of falls off is going to be insurance. It's going to be some of these things you need that we know that if somebody in that family passes away, that wealth from an insurance policy could take care of the whole family. Right. But we, we're trying to crowdfund things that if we were married and in a partnership, we could pay for ourselves. Mm -hmm. We could have that insurance to make sure that if something happened to us, our kids would be taken care of, that this house would be paid off, that this car note would be paid off. So working together, we have to get back to, and like you said earlier, it's okay to be different. It's okay Mm -hmm. to have different ideas, but we can't continue to do things that further fracture us as a people. Oh, yeah. Family's always gotten us through. Born in, you say born and raised in Des Moines? Born and raised in Des Moines. Oh, wow. Tell me a little bit about you growing up here, your parents, um, if you have siblings. I know you talk about your sister. Talk to me about the whole family dynamic thing. I'm interested to know. I know you read a lot when growing up. So. Yes. I did read a lot. Um, books, uh, boxes of books. Yeah. Um, I had really a beautiful childhood really kind of idyllic childhood. Like I said, both my parents were there and um, my dad bought a house. It's still owned by my sister and I. He provided a lot of like uh, uh, experiences. So my dad liked to travel around the state to all the state parks. And so so we traveled a lot. We took like little road trips. And even to this day, I love um, taking road trips, which is probably why I find it enjoyable to drive the newspaper from city to city. Okay. Um, (laughs) It makes sense. Yeah, because we we just went places. He took us to a lot of other states across the country several times to California where our other relatives um, lived. He took us down into Mexico. So, Mm. like, growing up, I had just different experiences. Just he really um, loved his family. He really prided himself in, in being a good being, father. Being and he father. was, um, he was one to give you like these big hugs and, and just, um, after he passed away, my sister and I talked a lot about how like the whole foundation dropped out of us. Like we mm. were unaware that we were up on this pedestal that our father yeah. had put us on. And then when he, and when he, he was wasn't gone. there, it was like, wait a minute. Like, yeah. you know, so that was a beautiful time. My mom, same thing. Yeah. A lot of people in the neighborhood, a lot of other kids, um, would always come running to my mom. She worked in Des Moines schools for 21 years. Oh, wow. Uh-huh. And, and she was a teacher's associate, library associate. So she very much loved the written word, books, and loved kids. And she was also, and I think that's where I get this from, very much a champion of the underdog. Yeah. 
Yeah. And so you combine, and then my dad was uh, also real. He kept it real about the racism that he experienced, you know, working yeah. as a black man in the 60s and 70s and so on. I think you couple all of that together. Uh, that helped my sister and I. They really focused on education. So it was just you two girls? Just us two. Okay. Yep, okay. Just us two. We went to college right out of high school. We, we both ended up dropping all, out and going to work because, you know, of course, people want to work and have yeah. their own money. But my dad, he was genius um, because he told me, even though I had stopped going to college, he said, hey, if you want to take some classes, I'll pay for your classes and your books, like whatever you want to take. <laughs> and I was like, okay. That's, so, that's the best way to get your kid back in college. <laughs> it is genius. And it worked. <laughs> and so I would just start taking, well, really things of interest to me. So at that time, I wanted to be a lawyer. So mm. I was taking like some pre-law classes. I, I liked art. I was taking art classes. Yeah. And then he passed away in 95. How, and old, how old was it? Actually, 94. He was only 56. Very young. A heart attack out of the blue. And again, you know, thankfully he had worked many years. He used to work for the city of Des Moines. He had great insurance. So, you know, that helped our family keep going. It helped mm. the, the continuity of bills and things. But yeah. all of a sudden he wasn't here. At that point, that's when my sister and I, we, we had this long conversation about, well, what should we do with our lives? Because we knew our dad's life was cut short. Yeah. Were you out of college at that point? No, I, no. Went, I, no, I was just still working, still yeah. taking oh. classes part time mm. and not really um, just kind of dr amassing credits, so yeah. to speak. And but after he passed away, like literally right after he passed away, um, I think it was shortly after his funeral, we had a deep conversation about how he hadn't got to do everything he wanted to do with his life. And yeah. what would we do with our chance? So I said, I can remember this conversation. I was like, well, I should put together everything that I like to do. I like to talk. I like to analyze. I like to read. I love the written word. And we, we talked over what career that would look like. And I was like, I want to be a reporter. And I don't think even up to that point, I had you never considered. Really? Mm -mm, never really so considered So basically it. your dad was that inspirational. He was very much. And so I graduated four years after that. Had a journalism degree, went to the register right away, and was really living out um, this dream that he helped make possible. Um, so I really do give him the credit for inspiring me to get my degree. Yeah. I very much wanted to accomplish that for him, and I did. And um, it's such a blessing to have. So wow. that's the importance of black fathers, if you want to talk about oh, black oh, fathers yeah. and black men. You know, and like I said, my dad's genius of still, he could have just let me go to work. I was working in, I had great jobs working in banks downtown and he was very but, proud. But he knew that would be temporary. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. He knew that would be temporary. And then as older you get, it's going to be tough for you to go back to school. So it, he was like, let me dangle this carrot and did. see if she's going to take a bite and boom, it's done deal. Cause at that time you are thinking, Oh, I'll do it. My dad is paying for it. Yeah. But in his mind, he's thinking I'm, I'm, I'm investing. There. Yes. And it helped pay off now. I give a lot of credit, too, to my mom as far as inspiring me to really be myself and yeah. that, you know, that I'm more than good enough for whatever I want to do. And so starting the newspaper, even though I'm starting this newspaper at a time when other Iowa papers are going failing, down. Yep. you know, they're going, they're, they're being wiped off the map. You have all of this media consolidation. Yeah. You have big companies gobbling up all these little media entities, mm -hmm. and now they no longer exist. Even in spite of all that, I feel like my mom was the one really pushing me that you can be your own boss, yeah. that you can be that entrepreneur, and you can bring your ideas to the public. Yeah. And, and, and I just ran with it. So, But my parents are very much a part of, and my sister too. Uh, my sister is like the, the beautiful thing about our little family was that we were very – Close, super close. close. Yeah. And so my sister is very much like that backbone. And she's brilliant in her own right. She was a teacher for many years. And she has helped me work through any idea I had for the paper, helped make it better, helped make Black Iowa News better. Yeah. She's researched. She's edited. She's very much invested in me. And so it the, it's, it's one thing to have a bestie, and people talk about their BFS, but it's yeah. another one it's your sister. 
Like you cannot get any better than that. So how did your parents meet? You know, that is a good question that, gosh, do I know the answer to that? You've stumped you, me. You, you, no, you know why I ask you that question? A lot of black people, when I ask them how their parents meet, they don't know. Because oh, it's like, that's, that's never been a conversation in our house, oh. Right. I'm not sure I do. <laughs> All I know is they lived in the same neighborhood. At some point, I believe they went to school together. But I really couldn't tell you the story of like that exact well, moment that they met. Well, well, they, were, they were also born and raised in Iowa? Um, yes, both. Oh, of okay. Them. Mm-hmm. Oh, so you guys, few generation. Yep, have mm. been there. I don't. I often growing up, I was like, why wouldn't they just go on and move to like Minneapolis or Kansas City or move to Chicago, somewhere move somewhere else. Yeah. else? But we we did have a great lifestyle. My dad had worked for like the packing plant. Yeah. Back in the day. Okay. So we we were probably considered middle class. You know, we were homeowners. We. Um, like I said, he was able to provide some great experiences. And my mom, too, because she went to work after we reached, I want to say, like, maybe first grade, somewhere in there. Yeah. I remember it being said that um, she was always like the homeroom mom mm. and that the school eventually was like, well, you just need to come work here because you're always here yeah. anyway. Our family was very, you know, um, like we loved on each other. We just were very much supportive of each other. And. You know, I know some families, you know, they grew up getting spankings and whoopings and things like that. But my parents didn't believe in that. So mm. my sister and I, we didn't grow up with that. And I and I don't even remember a time that we ever got like, what's that thing that the kids get where? I sh- where switch. I, I, sh- <laughs> I, sh- I should grow up in your family. I got enough of those. No, we, did, we didn't. <laughs> and And a lot of it, though, it had to do with the fact of, their upbringing mm. and that they had made a conscious decision as parents not to, not it. to bring it to their children. So yeah. I give them many props for that. Yeah. You know, we just grew up with a lot of love. Yeah. Um, we grew up watching the news okay. and that's something that I really would love. I really feel like we need as a people to be doing that today, um, mm. to really knowing what's going on in the world. We It's so that's that true. we're not making decisions when, when something's happening. We need, we, we need to be able to see what's coming. Yeah. And a lot of times, many people around me, you know, we, we talk like when the pandemic happened, you know, I, all of a sudden, because I was studying it all day long, um, researching, you know, I was a wealth of knowledge about it. And people around me are like, oh, I don't watch news. I don't know what's going on. And I was like, yeah. well, how are you going to keep yourself safe? How are you going to keep your kids safe yeah. if you don't know what's happening? How do you, talking about news, I try to uh, watch news. How do you stay sane? <laughs> Doing that, <laughs> it's it's so true, and yeah. and even I, um, when I watch the news, I understand each station kind of what their slant is. Yeah, like the this I won't name the station, but the station that I watch, I've discerned that they're pro police because they pretty much report anything the police say as gospel. They tend to like to have like a lot of crime photos. And things like that. So you're seeing black people, you know, in orange jumps. You're seeing us in that light. Now, they'll throw in a nice little feel-good feature story occasionally. But at the same time, um, and I was on this uh, other podcast recently where I mentioned we have to diversify our news sources. So that... The problem is, is if that's the only place you're getting your news, right? Yeah, that's, that, yep, that's their true. Their slant is is seeping in. But if you're looking at this station and this station, if you're reading this paper and that paper, paper, you're going online and reading this source, then you're well rounded, yeah. and you have, uh, you know, because there's no, I mean, there there is there are facts, even though some media like to act today like there's not facts. There are facts, and we can find them, but we have to just diversify our sources. Yeah. The crazy thing is sometimes you might get more clear picture by reading or listening the news from overseas about United States. They do present our news in a different way, and and, it, and it's interesting to watch. But, you know, yeah. at the same time, we do have some good news outlets here um, and we do like ProPublica is one that I really love ProPublica's mm. work. Um, so read their stories and I share their stories on the Facebook page, okay. like Iowa News' Facebook page, um, where they're, again, working on behalf of the people, working to get answers, working to present facts. Now you are, your father passed away. You're not a, in college yet. Now you're thinking about going to college. 
and you're thinking about doing the journalism. You go to college, where did you go? Drake? Grandview University. Grandview. Mm-hmm. You go to Grandview, you do your four years of journalism. You get out there, you go to the register? Yes. How long did you work at the register? Seven years. Seven years. So from covering city city disputes to um, suburban education, statewide education, immigration, minority affairs. Okay. After seven years, you're thinking, through that time, you're thinking like, uh, this is, yeah, journalism is my calling, but uh, not here. I got to find uh, something else to do. So what pushed you to say, this is it, this is the time, I'm out? (laughs) So at that time, the register was undergoing major changes. The physical side of the newspaper was reduced, Mm. um, major staff reductions. So it was in upheaval. And in that upheaval, they wanted to reduce me back to covering like city council. I clawed my way to, I felt the top, right? Yeah. And was really doing the work I wanted to do. And then all of a sudden it was just like, you know, we'll have you, you know. In the back office. Yeah. And I said, no. Now, my ability to say no, that's my dad working in me. Because my dad very Mm. much taught me to be, to stand on my two own. Yeah. And to not just take anything that anybody wanted to give me. And to, to operate in a way that, that you understand that regardless of any title, you're still perfectly fine the way you are. So, you know, in putting that to use, I rejected taking that position and I left. I oh. put it, I resigned and then I started doing, um, I actually worked for the bystander for a little okay. small amount of time. And I just started doing other things. But doing these other things, working in other fields, like I was an insurance agent. I had a financial license at Mm. one point. Um, I did internal communications for a college. It all, yeah, it came together for my good because I know a lot about these kind of disparate things. Yeah. So that helped me be, I think, a better... Journalist? uh, Yeah, a better Mm -hmm. journalist, but a better um, entrepreneur in terms of understanding what I needed to do to make this work. It's a, a lot of work. I wish it was just strictly writing stories because I love to do that. But it's a lot. There's so much behind the scenes of keeping the company going, of trying to be a good steward of any resources that I get because people subscribe. You can go on the website, blackhawknews.com. They subscribe, you know, $10 a month, $25 a month. That's what helps keep me going. So I try to be a good steward of that. And then also stay in the learning mode to see what's coming down the pike for journalism next. Figuring out, uh, when I decided to do the newspaper, I hadn't laid out a newspaper since college. So I hadn't thought about layout. You know, of course, things change in 20 years, right? People were like, oh, just hire someone. Just hire someone to do the layout. And I was like, no, I'm going to do the layout myself. I'm going to learn, relearn how to do it. And mm-hmm. so I discovered that I love doing the layout. Okay. I love thinking about how the stories that I've written and others have written will be presented because I want the presentation to the black community to be the best that I could possibly make it. Mm-hmm. So I study other newspaper designs and I try to incorporate those principles into what I'm doing. So there's lots of different elements that had I not at one of these jobs that, that I maybe didn't really care for, I learned certain Something. elements like even just customer service, which you know was missing so much from today's oh, yeah. uh, interactions with people. Um, a lot of what I learned about that helped me, Grow the paper. And you can always connect the dots by looking back. Yes, you can. Never going forward. (laughs) Yep, never going forward. It's always by looking back. You'd be like, ah, I almost did not want to take that position, but I'm glad I did. Or leave it. I mean, the ability to leave leave. is also something. And you want people not to feel trapped where they work. And Mm -hmm. I've certainly had small moments of that. But for the most part... I try to live in such a way that if I had to leave, mm-hmm. I could leave. When did the idea, because you, you launched the newspaper in June 2023, mm-hmm. June 22nd, actually, to be exact. When did the idea hit in your head? Like, maybe I should do this. I kind of want to get to the emotional roller coaster from the time the, the seed was planted in your heart 
to the time you say, okay, I'm going to do it to the time you actually launch the newspaper. Walk me through that process. Yeah. So I was very blessed to be working with the Black Media Initiative. So I was on a, a weekly call for about 15 months with Black publishers around the country, Michigan, Texas, Atlanta, out east, California, all these different places. And I loved being exposed to like new ideas. Yeah. So you had these, several of them were black women publishers. They had been publishing their newspapers for like 20 years. And I'd listen to when we had these like one hour meetings, everyone would share what they're doing. And at that time, Black Iowa News was just digital. And I'd listen to their stories about their papers and what they were saying it meant to the community and what it meant to them to do it. I started following them on social media, getting a newspaper subscription. You know, when their paper came in the mail, I'd look through it. I'm like, this is so cool, you know. And I didn't realize then the idea was starting to turn. Also, is that if you have a question, you know, people be like, oh, well, just call me up. And they're so open and willing to help you. And so I just started calling a, a few of the publishers and picking their brain. You know, and and I didn't realize I was even at that time putting together a plan for a paper, but I just wanted to know more about what it was like to run one and what it took. You know, like how much money does this take? Where'd you find your printer? You know, what size is your paper? I started like assessing it all, but I got to the point where I started kind of putting, writing all these notes in the same place. And I was like, I'm going to start a newspaper. And I'm going to drive it around the state. Those are the two things that came to my mind. And then I didn't tell anyone, though, initially, because mm. I know that if I if I say it, I'm really going to have to do it. Yep. <laughs> and then people hold you accountable. They do. Yeah. And I and I hold myself accountable. And I got to talking to I can't even remember who it was. And I just said I was thinking about starting a newspaper. It was like, well, now I have to make it happen because mm-hmm. I don't put it out into the air. One of the things is. One person, I remember them telling me, oh, well, you know, we tried to do that and it didn't work. I love that in a way because it was like, well, that was them and that was then. Yep. I personally haven't tried to do one, so let me try. And the way that I'm set up is that if I accomplish something that I set out to do, then I'm good. Even if I only did one edition of that newspaper, I would feel like a, a success because that's what I set out to do made my mind up. And then I just started methodically. It, the vision came to light, but it wasn't until the first edition was here. My husband and I, we had to go to Sheldon, Iowa, four hours away to pick it up. And in that video, I'm still just sitting there like, Oh my God. Oh my God. It was like a child was born. Like, because here all these crazy ideas you had in your head and now it's, it's down on paper and it's a massive amount of paper in the back of this fan. And that's where you really get to say, you know, like you did what you said you were going to do. So I was proud of it from that aspect. But Mm. I was even more proud later on when we're driving the paper to Fort Dodge the very first time. And we took it to Agape Church and we're standing around with some members and the pastor and some people from Fort Dodge. And one of the ladies, she took the paper and she kind of clutched it to her. And we all had like a moment where we kind of got teary eyed over it. Mm. And that was surprising to me. But that again, that's how much that tells you something about the fact of when we're not represented, how we feel. And and it's a form of trauma that we're that that's internalized. Mm. And then you see this representation, you see someone trying to give light to what you're doing and give light to your story and uplift you, yeah. it meant something to them. So I felt just so encouraged at that point. And, um, you know, now, again, like I said, it's um, expensive to produce the paper. What can people do to help? What can people do? Yeah. People can just donate, hit any of these uh, QR codes I have, mm-hmm. donate what you can, read it, share it, become a member you become a subscriber. There's lots of things people yeah. can do. But financially, when people help, that allows me to pay for interns because I do have some interns. I do have um, an assistant and, you know, art. There's different things that I'd have to pay for, the yeah. website. Um, so it, it helps me do all of these things. Mm. And I very much, Eric, wanted it to be something where 
it is supported by us. It, it's for us. For, uh, yeah. So we should be the ones supporting it, right? I, yeah. I really feel is that. It, is, it, is it like the FUBU slogan, for us, by us? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> you know, we got to co-opt that yeah. a little bit. But yes, I very much want it to be something. And people support it, and, I, and I've and i received so much good emails and and even handwritten letters and people tell mm. me all the time how much it means to them and that they love it but i also need them to um to help support, support it yeah so that it's not a struggle to keep this going and i'm always working f with different news organizations yeah. um, and foundations to try to improve its sustainability yeah absolutely so for people who don't get the actual newspaper because there's a qr code on a newspaper and stuff how can they go? Can they go on, online to support? Yep, absolutely. Okay. BlackIowaNews.com or the Facebook page, the at symbol at Black Iowa News. Um, there's different ways there. But yes, there's uh, links and QR codes. Also, email me, okay. Dana, at BlackIowaNews.com. Okay. Um, the, the, there you go. People don't act like you don't know now. <laughs> yeah. Now, was the Black Iowa News, was that the first name you came up with? It was. Oh, was it? It was. Oh, wow. You That's, know why? Yeah. Because I wanted it. I wanted to be intentional about who it was for. I, you know, before I had tried in um, going back about three years before Black Iowa News, I had I dabbled in starting an online news site, and that was called Epiphany Three Sixty Five. Okay. And you could see how, even though I love the word Epiphany, but you could see how that could get lost amongst all these other, other news sites. But Black Iowa News tells you something about it. And there's a lot more that connects us, I think, across the state than I ever knew. Traveling this newspaper from border to border, rolling up to communities in this truck with my husband, and we're getting out. We're finding all where the black churches are. Yeah. We're finding the grocery stores, finding people to talk to. It just made me um, realize in seeing how people reacted to having the paper mm -hmm. that we do have unity, you know, and, and often, you know, what you talk about the most gets the most attention, right? So I feel like now, especially, we need to talk about that. We need to talk about the unity that we do have yep. and the connection that we do have and build that and let all the other whatever problems, past things, let those fade away. Because people in other parts of the state, they need us. We need to see the genius that is happening in Mason City and Sioux City and Dubuque and Waterloo and all these places. There are children right now, and I've talked to some, that have seen people in the paper and were blown away oh, because yeah. they just didn't know these community leaders existed. They didn't know that there's all this genius and greatness out there mm -hmm. because we don't see it all together. Now, we might see a piece in this newspaper. We might see one story, one, uh, story during the TV news, yeah. but we don't see it all together, and I think that's part of the beauty of the Black Iowa newspaper is that you're flipping these 20, 24, 28 pages. Yeah. And it's nothing but beautiful black people working in their communities. Um, doing positive things. Yeah, doing positive things. How do you, uh, you probably, maybe, maybe you don't want to share this. How do you go about, how do you find your stories? Oh, yeah, all over the place, yeah. all over the place. So the story that I wrote about Grandma Annie I was uh, speaking at a conference mm -hmm. and someone in the audience came up to me and said, Hey, I'm from Charles city and I run this program and grandma Annie is a part of it. And she's, you know, really cool. And so I, I found her there, but some of it is the curiosity I have about things, especially like back when I was writing more about COVID, a lot of it was just out of the curiosity of how's it affecting us. I had written a, Three part series about domestic violence. And so it, it's just a lot of it is curiosity, trends that I see happening, stats that come to yeah. me that spark, you know, a lot of the stats that black people in Iowa experience, like being 4% of the population and 25% of the prison population, and that number being the same as it was 20 years ago, mm. that is by design. That yep. is not. And then, and then and then our boys don't know how to read and write by design. That twenty percent in prison population is not going to go down. It's not unless we say no, 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 no. This is not acceptable for us. Right. We have to change things at every step. From like you're saying, when these black students are 
you know, first grade, second grade, third grade, all the way through to their adults. Mm -hmm. We have to give them something to want on the other side. Oh, yeah. We, you know, in terms of careers, in terms of trades, Mm -hmm. in terms of college, in terms of community, they have to see that we are a black community and that we do support each other. And if they're going to live here, they, they, they too, we want them to be a part of the solution. Oh yeah. And I think we need to expose them to, to, I'll give you a perfect example. I was talking to one young black boy, 15, 16, maybe two weeks ago. And he asked me, what do you do? I'm like, I'm an accountant. What is that? What is that? Yeah. So I was like, oh, he does not know what accounting is. So I started kind of break down to him mm-hmm. what that is. So that goes back to what we talked about when that principal approached me about going to the school. It's like the fact that we show up there, we tell these young kids what we do. It gives them more options. To say, oh, maybe I can do that. Then we can have a bigger conversation. Absolutely. Now you have a lot going on in this. How many pe- how many more people helping you to do? I'm I'm assuming you are not chasing all the stories and write them all by yourself, because otherwise, you will not be able to sleep. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of the time I am, but this particular issue, I had stories by. Rochelle Chase, which she's an author. She's written a lot good. about books. Too. Yeah, good friend of mine. Yeah, yeah, so she was great. I I loved her help in there. Um, I'm trying to think if anyone else wrote any of the other stories. I mean, a lot of it is me, and I'm always, oh, um, Anthony Arrington from Cedar Rapids. He had a letter to the editor, and Marie from Cedar Rapids also wrote about black farmers. Mm. Um, so there were some stories by other people, but a lot of it. I'm I'm doing all of the roles, so it's yeah. the idea of creation. It's the kind of mocking up what the edition will be. It's deciding what stories go in, what ones don't. It's the presentation, yeah. and but over time, you know, hopefully the organization Black Eyed News is more uh, financially stable. stable yeah. I'll be able to hire more people. Also, Shamay Obi, which she's the news assistant. But mm. she wrote a piece because she has a, a small business. Okay. So she wrote a piece about um, virtual assistants. So I think as time wears on, I want to see more youth contributing because we know our youth are very creative. Oh, yeah. So whether it's fashion or sports or poetry or um, just their images, I, I want to add okay. more. So as as we go on, I think I, I see adding them. Okay. How do you go about, because uh, that's another thing, even on my end too, how somebody will tell me about the story I need to do and I'll start looking into the story and I'm like, I'm not a journalist, but this does not look legit. <laughs> how, do, how, how, how much research do you have to dig into it? before you put the story out? Because we've seen this in the, in the media before, in a journalism world, somebody put the story out, they stand behind, and then two weeks later, it's like, uh, that was not legit. Yeah. That, so a lot. So my um, Endangered series on Black Maternal Health, that took about three months to do mm. from beginning to end, including all of those photos, interviewing people that, you know, did the conducted the studies. Some other stories like Grandma Annie, a story like that, there's essentially two people in the story, but it's, it's still an insane amount of fact checking in there. An mm. insane amount. Yeah. Um, it's still all of my stories, you know, I write them and it's going through layers of editing. Okay. And one of the editors who is one of my besties, Audrey Bergs, she was the former Night City editor at the Register. So, you know, top notch. Mm. Um, so, it's going through her. It's going through my sister, who is, for lack of a better word, a news junkie yeah. um, and a former teacher. So it's just going through layers of editing. And even, you know, when I'm doing those final reads, I try to read it like with fresh eyes, like I've never seen this before to see if I can pick out. Um, but invariably, you know, people are human and invariably, oh, yeah. you know, a mistake you know, will be made. Yeah. Cause, and I swear, as soon as I get the paper some time back, I'll flip through and I'll be like... <laughs> 
why is this like this? Why is this in this font? I really mm. wanted it to be in this font. Yeah. But I, but when you've worked with it for so long, it's hard to see. You, how do you stay objective? Like, hey, I need to do this story. Oh, I want to do this story. But I maybe I don't like anything about the person. Who's, I mean, it can be a lot of things and it can mess up the story. How do you stay objective? I think staying objective for me is... I'll say, well, Dana James can have a grudge, okay, but Black Iowa News cannot. Black Iowa News is about the people. I love it. And, you know, in order to carry out my mission, you know, you have to stay on that. Yeah. Um, but what I've learned since I started doing Black Iowa News is that we can't stay objective if our existence is being questioned. Great. Yeah, okay. For me, as a as a journalist, that's where I draw the line. I'm not I'm not going to portray the people who are trying to make us be extinct. I don't feel the need to be objective about that. In one of my trainings, I went to in D.C. last year, and it was a Pulitzer Prize winner who was doing the training. She said that, and I liked her quote. She said that what you have to do is you have to state your case. You have to state both sides and mm. then you let the crazy people, you let the crazy people have their say and then you move on and you use the rest of your story to show why those people are crazy. Mm. And I just, yeah. And I <laughs> just, I love that philosophy, <laughs> but if it's a garden variety story, like say for some of the things that are happening right now in state government. Yeah. So like, say for example, I wrote a story about the, how they're trying to, the state's trying to do away with the area education agencies. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, that's a story where I'm going to get pro and I'm going to get con. Yeah. But if it's a story about some program that's basically going to pitch black people into poverty or something, I don't have to be objective oh, yeah. about that because that's our existence. So yeah, Black see. Iowa News is very much about being pro-black, being about our liberation, being about our future, and I don't have to be objective, objective. about that. Yes, there's no objectivity when it comes to evil. Exactly. Point <laughs> blank. Okay, yeah. I couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> what are some of the things people are getting wrong? Oh, the misconception of black media. Oh, my. Misconception of black media. For one, I think, in general, people don't think that we need it. They think that these legacy organizations that have been doing it are enough. Like anything with black people, people as a whole tend to question its authenticity, its competence, mm -hmm. the need for it. But again, I reject all of that. We need this. We need to be connected to each other. We need to educate. The, the mission for the paper, the motto is prioritizing, educating, and uplifting ourselves. Like because it. we don't need other people to do that for us. Mm -hmm. We have to do that for us. That's what Black Iowa News is about. We just pulled out of excellence because there's a lot of black excellence going on, but people are just in the shadow. You know, and another thing, um, Lanissa Cassell from the African American Museum of Iowa. What's up, Lanisha? <laughs> she had mentioned how, you know, we're always uncovering new black history. So there's a lot of things that we may not know, and yeah. but you always, I always bristled a little bit at because I, I felt like I should know. Yep. But yep. I love, love, love that she said, you know, we're always uncovering new things and we're going to continue. And, and let's celebrate that. Not, not the not knowing. Mm -hmm, you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Because oh, yeah. now we know about. Now we know. Let's put it up front. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I remember she, she mentioned something like that when I interviewed her for the podcast, too. They're like, hey, we are here and we keep uncovering new stuff. And now they got the museum bigger than it was. Right. And I think it's going to be more and more thing. You're right. I mean, when we uncover things, let's put in the street and on, on, on the front, like, hey. Yeah, this, this is great. We, we found is, out. We know now. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with that because some of what we don't know has been intentionally hidden oh, yeah. anyway. Oh, yeah. So, it, you know. I'm curious to know what's your thought about. Black History Month. So Black History Month. I love Black History Month. We need it. I mean, we know 
we do Black History Month 365. And in there, I wrote a, a piece at the beginning of the winter edition talking mm. about how we do that. And that is the uncovering stories that we don't know. Yeah. That is sharing what we do know. That is uplifting us and helping us be seen where other publications don't do that. I mean, that's that's all I do is 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 learn about more and more about black history. So I share yeah. that kind of love you have of it. When I had written about uh, Ross, state rep Ross Wilburn's yeah. great great grandfather who was in the Civil War, it was like dis- discovering like a, a new toy or something. I I was so like enamored with what these black people had accomplished at that time mm. because you had black women in Keokuk who created the flag that's hanging in the in the um state, in the state historical yep. society which i love that flag like thinking about these black people like alexander clark like ross's great great grandfather thinking about them accomplishing anything yet alone greatness at a time when everything is opposing you where you could be killed at any time mm-hmm. you could be just snatched off the board at any time but they still believed in each other they still aimed as high as they could it's, it's, yep it's inspiring and that's why they don't, so. that's why people don't want us to know it because it is inspiring it inspired me to learn more about it's, it's, black men uh, absolutely it's very inspiring how can we hold each other's accountable without allowing other people to use that against us. I feel like if Dr. King and Malcolm will be taking a shot at each other in private, just like giving each other the call, like, hey, I just don't like the way you run it because of one, two, three. I think you would not give other people in the public the idea that these guys are going at it. So let's just lighten up more fire. Right. I think by focusing on solutions, publicly focusing on the solutions. And then maybe um, if we've got some grievances, we need to work those out on, mm-hmm. a, on a Zoom, a private Zoom yeah. or a call. But we need to stay focused on the solutions, I on the goal. It. And if we keep uplifting that, we'll bring more people along. Yeah. And and we have to recognize that there's tension inherently in in many things that we do. Yeah. Now, like you said, not everybody's going to agree on even what the solution is. But at some point, we, we have to move from the idea stage to the putting it on paper to doing it stage. Mm. Like you're saying with going into the schools, working with black students, working with black male students in particular. Yeah. We don't need to have a, a long, deep conversation. We don't need to have nine calls on strategy. Yeah. We just need to say on it. Monday, we're going into the schools and we're going to do this. Yeah. And then we're, and then add more people in to the conversation. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the things I want to do too, um, that I have coming up is I'm going to, along with Anthony Arrington, we're, we're going to be having a, a call, like a black eye news call, a zoom. And on there, we're just going to get to know each other. Mm-hmm. Anybody can join in. I'll send a, out a link. People can register. Yeah. And then, we just build upon, if this is a movement, whatever it is, we build yeah. upon our connections to get mm-hmm. things done. But, I, I mean, we're, we're to the point where this society is so, it wants to tell everything. It wants everything out. Hey, yep, yep, and that's the problem. It, right. It's not always a good thing to air all of that. And very much growing up in a black community, you had some things that, you know, this was, you, this stayed in the house. You didn't talk yeah. about everything everywhere. You, you don't even know how your parents met. <laughs> Touche. Yeah. <laughs> Touche. You, you think you're going to be spilling the beans on anything else? <laughs> right. <laughs> you out your mind. <laughs> oh, my gosh. That's a good one. But right. Exactly. That's yeah. it. What is the role of journalism, you think, in today's world? It's super important. Mm. It's super important. Um, people need credible information. They need accurate information. They need well-vetted sources Yep. They need to understand really what a story is and how journalism, you know, how it goes from the idea stage to the paper stage and, and everything, all of the research that is done to get those words on the paper. Yeah. Um, they need to, to understand, to be critical of mm-hmm. any journalism, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. to take everything with a grain of salt yeah. and, you know, to trust but verify. Before you share garbage, before you share the latest trending thing, yeah. take a beat and think about, is, does this make sense? 
Because there's plenty of things that, especially with the AI and things like that, oh, yeah. being playing even more of a role, we're going to have to be, we're, we're, everybody's going to have to be a little journalist. Everybody's going to have to think, uh, I don't know, this doesn't sound right. I'm not going to share it because I only want to share things that are credible, came from a credible source. We yeah. just have to be more in discernment that mm. not everything you see, especially this the generation here in the last 15, 20 years, that's very much social media, social media, social media, sharing likes and all of this. They're being swayed more by things that they're seeing. You know, it's, it's nothing for them. They've grew up in this kind of internet generation, yeah. but we need them to, to think more critically because there are nefarious people and entities that are trying to manipulate them. If uh, journalism did not exist, what would Dana James do? Journalism didn't exist. Um, you, you almost wanted to be a lawyer. I did at one time. I was, I'm too emotional to be a lawyer. Like I get too passionate about things. <laughs> I know. And, you know, yeah. So I don't know that that would be the best thing. Um, what would I do? At one time, I wanted to be a beautician. I know I'd want to be a whatever it is now. Yeah. Know what I've known. What I know, I'd want to own it. Mm. To me, ownership is key, is key for whatever you're doing. I was just telling this young person the other day, yes, you can go get a great job, you know, get a education, and you can go work someplace and get some great experience. I'm not knocking that. Yeah. But never, never, never allow yourself to just think that that's all there is. You could own that company. Yeah. You could create something right now that would change this entire world. Yep, and ownership gives freedom. It does get freedom. Yeah, you get to do whatever you want to do. Man, we can't keep going forever. But <laughs> <laughs> Anything else you did not talk about you want to touch? Let me think real quick. I feel like we t touched a lot. Yeah, we touched a lot. I wanted to make sure that people, you know, do support the paper. Yeah. We talked about. Yeah, we I talk, think we talked about that. Yeah. Well, that was Dana James the founder and publisher of Black Iowa News. Thank you, Dana. You're welcome. Thank you so much, Eric. Thank you.